Okay, I'm going to be talking about the future of SVG and web standards. I work on Inkscape. Inkscape uses SVG as its native storage uh, format. And from that, I got interested in working, I got invited to work with the SVG working group on improving SVG uh, in the future. So this talk is going to be about what's coming up in the next version of SVG. And then I'm going to also comment a little bit about web standards. I think it's important to understand how the web standards get created and what you can do to uh, help that process. So I have a quick introduction, what SVG is, a short history of SVG, and then I'm going to talk about the SVG2, and then, as I mentioned, I'll talk about a little bit about web standards. In case you don't know, SVG it stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. There are basically two kinds of graphics. There's the bitmap graphics, which is basically just pixels being turned on and off, and there are vector graphics, where you define a line by defining two points and say, okay, I want, I want to have a line from this point to that point. And that's scalable. You can change the size, make it bigger, make it smaller, and it's always going to have the same accuracy. So it's, it's quite advantageous. Now, in real life, all displays, in fact, are raster devices. So the real difference between a bitmap graphic and a vector graphic is at the point when the rasterization takes place. With SVG, it takes place at the last, or vector graphics in general, it takes place at the last moment when you're about to display it, when you know what your resolution of the screen is going to be. So you can see, oh, I'm, I'm missing a, a figure there. When your screen resolution is the same as the resolution of your bitmap, there's no real difference in, in uh, the two methods, but as soon as you enlarge something, then you can start seeing in a bitmap, you can start seeing the, the pixelization take place. Okay, where can you find SVG used? Well, right now, all the major browsers support it natively. Uh, it's been used in mobile phones for quite a while. Even before smartphones came along, it was being used. Actually, a special version of SVG was being used called SVG Tiny, which had less demands on the processor in the phone. Drawing programs, as I mentioned, Inkscape uses it as its native format. One thing that surprised me to learn is that most TV set-top boxes use SVG. Uh, eBooks, EPUB 3, specifies that SVG is one of the formats that you can use for, for images. It's used in some other st strange places. Uh, plotters and cutters can be driven using, using SVG. And there's a, an interface from Inkscape that drives this thing called an egg bot, which allows you to draw patterns on eggs. Uh, it's used in mapping. Of course, it's, it's very useful in mapping because you want to be able to change scales. Uh, they're interested in using it for document storage because it's an open standard that's very easy. It's XML, and I'll talk about that in a second, which makes it easy, even if SVG is no longer being used in the future, you can Take, easily translate the XML into whatever the, the next new best thing is. And one interesting talk at, in an S, a conference I went to a couple years ago was someone interested in using it for graphics, for, for Braille, for, for blind people, it can be able to feel things. Uh, uh, you would have a device that, that raises up uh, parts so you can, you can feel with your fingers. Okay. Uh, a little short history, SVG is based on PGML, which is derived from PostScript, and VML from Microsoft. It was basically taking the features of those two things and merging them together. And it uses XML. XML stands for Extensible Markup Language, uh, which is interesting because you can then mix, if you have different XML specifications, you can mix them together because they have namespaces. It's very easy to do that, put MathML and SVG inside an XHTML uh, document. It's easy to parse. Uh, it allows round tripping between formats, something that you can't do with HTML. Uh, and it can be styled with CSS. And so here's an example of a very simple SVG file, or uh, uh, well, file, I guess. Uh, Basically, you, you list the namespace, the size of the document, the width and the height, uh, and then you have a circle, you define the center of the circle, 
you see the radius, and you say you want the field to be red. Uh, I see the alignment isn't, isn't quite the same as on my screen. Uh, you have attributes, and you also, those things like fill, you can also determine or specify the fill using style, uh, which you can then change using CSS. Okay, SVG is a W3C standard. It was, SVG 1 was published in 2001. SVG 1.1 1 .1 in 2003. SVG 1.2, there was a draft in 2005, but it was never published. So what happened? Well, politics got in the way. Adobe bought Flash. Adobe was the primary mover behind SVG. And when they bought Flash, they no longer had any interest in supporting SVG at all. Also, Microsoft ignored SVG completely. All the other browsers started to support SVG, but Internet Explorer didn't until version 9. And the W3C was going through a rough period of time. They stumbled with the conversion of HTML was supposed to be changed into XHTML, which is a better format for parsing and for being able to mix standards together. And well, I, Microsoft IE6 wasn't interested in something new. Well, more recently, the other browsers got together and said, well, well this move to XHTML isn't working. Well, we need, you know, nothing's happening, but we have new and new demands on what we want, want to do. And so there was a group formed, what WG, which basically abandoned the move to XHTML. And, but they did include SVG and MathML in the HTML5 specification. Even though SVG and MathML are XML, they have special ways of, of, of fitting it in even without having the namespaces. And re more recently, Adobe has given up on Flash. Adobe has come out strongly behind HTML5. And Microsoft finally supports SVG. So the interest in SVG has really grown recently. And in 2011, SVG 1.1 second edition came out. It was basically a maintenance version, lots of bug fixes. And now we're ready to move on to SVG 2. SVG 2 is rapidly being developed. There's a lot of activity. The working group has expanded. There are more on the phone calls. We have weekly phone meetings. There are a lot more people on those phone calls than there were just two or three years ago. There are 45 members in the group with an active core of about 10. There's active participation by Adobe, Canon, Google, IBM, Inkscape, Institute Telecom, a French uh, university, or Institute, Mozilla, Opera, and the W3C itself. And there is some participation, although not quite as active, by Apple, KDDI as a Japanese phone company, and Microsoft. Now some things to comment about this uh, group now. It's dominated by browser vendors and it's HTML, CSS biased. Many members also belong to the CSS working group, which is much, much larger and much, much more active. And the comment I want to make is that most, if not all, members would not, I don't think, would think would consider themselves to be designers. And I, I think this has an effect on what gets put in to the specification. So, What's happening with SVG2? Well, SVG2 is basically SVG1.1 being ripped apart. It's rip, being ripped apart into an SVG2 core and lots of modules that are being shared with CSS. And there will possibly be a few modules that will be orphaned, like SVG fonts. I'll we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. This is a good thing in that the modules that are shared with CSS are more likely to be quickly incorporated into browsers, such as CSS3 colors which allows you to specify colors using an HSL value. That's our, you can already do that. Even in SVG, you can do that in, in the browsers, at least the ones I tested. Although being incorporated into the CSS and being used in HTML doesn't always necessarily mean that you can use it in SVG yet. SV, SVG is a low priority for most of these browsers, probably all the browser vendors. Their main focus is HTML. So just because something from CSS is, is available in HTML, it doesn't mean it's available in SVG yet. 
but hopefully it will be soon. And one case of that is 3D transforms. You can do 3D transforms in HTML. You can make your, your boxes rotate and do all kinds of fancy things, but you can't do that natively in SVG yet. This is also a bad thing because CSS HTML interests dominate. The SVG group, group can't just make changes by itself. Last week, uh, due to some problems with Inkscape, I brought up the, the problem of image rendering. Uh, right now, when you take a bitmap and you scale it up, the specification says that you have to use some kind of fancy algorithm to scale it up. And what you end up, if you have just a, uh, suppose you have some bitmap art, you end up with it all blurred, when a lot of times you want it to maintain its blocky nature. And you can control that kind of with image rendering by misusing it. Well, I brought up the group and, and found out when I was doing that, that actually image rendering has been taken over by a CSS image specification, so we can't just go in and change it and add this blocky thing. Now, they're doing that, but it's gonna be a year or two years before it's gonna be released. We can't just put it in the spec now and, and, and be done with it. So, there's also some problems with breaking things apart. So what is the SVG2 gonna look like? Well, there's the core, as I mentioned. There's CS animations, which are not smile-based. Smile, -based. smile is, a, is a way of animating things that the SVG animation isn't exactly, native animation isn't exactly smile, but it's based on smile. So the animate, way you're gonna anim animate SVG is up in the air in the future. You can always use JavaScript, et cetera, but then you get problems with security issues, et cetera. It's, it's not always useful. Uh, CSS backgrounds isn't really part of SVG, but uses SVG. You can specify backgrounds uh, in CSS using SVG now. CSS color, I already mentioned. CSS compositing and blending. They've taken the modes of, for blending and compositing out of SVG and putting them in a separate specification. Uh, exclusions and shapes. These are used for flowing text into regions or excluding text from a region. And hopefully that will replace flow text, which is something that was in an SV the SVG 1.2 specification, which never got adopted. Inkscape actually does support flow text, but when, if, you ex if, you, if you don't export it as regular text and you try to view your Inkscape SVG on a, a web browser, you're not gonna see the text. CSS filter effects. For example, blurring things, making a drop shadow. That's been removed from SVG, is now in its own uh, specification. CSS fonts, the way of specifying a font. It's not the same thing as SVG fonts. So I was talking about SVG fonts is the actual design and being able to animate the fonts and, and do all kinds of crazy things with them. The CSS fonts is more about specifying, I want to use this font, and if this font isn't available, I'll fall back to this font, this character's not available, or maybe I want to use all caps or something. That's in the CSS font specification. Image values and replacement content. Uh, masking, uh, I'm gonna, being short on time, so I'll have to go a little quicker. Uh, text decoration, that is underlining, overlining, things like that. Transforms, those 3D transforms, like perspective transform that you can now do in HTML, that's all defined in CSS transforms. Uh, and web fonts, web fonts, uh, fonts that are being downloaded. There may, there's an effort to put SVG inside of the true type fonts. And the reason for doing that is, is internationalization. It's a bit complicated, you can ask me later. I guess I don't have time to go into that. So let's go to the SVG, SVG2 editions. The first one is solid color element. This allows, allows you to have custom palettes that you can then change at a future time. Inkscape simulates this by using one-stop gradients, but you can't then use that color everywhere. You can't use it, for example, in gradient stops. In CSS, you can, you can uh, style things with color, but you need to have a different, if, suppose you want to style the border, the, the uh, stroke of an object with the same color that you, that, you, that you use for a fill of a different object. You can't do that easily in CSS right now. So having a solid color element in SVG allows you to do that. Flexible paint order. SVG, in SVG 1.1, the stroke is always on top, which, in the case of if you want to have a stroke around a letter, it doesn't work so well. It's better to have the fill on top and the stroke underneath. So that's a, a, a change. Uh, SVG 1.1, the stroke is always evenly placed around the edge of an object, half in, half outside. If you, 
it'd be nice to be able to specify I want it all on the outside or all on the inside. Well, it turns out that this is actually being deferred because there's nobody working on, the, on it. But so if you want this, you should holler at the SVG working group. Holler? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not, not just at me, though. <laughs> uh, arc line join. There are three traditional ways in, uh, of, in PostScript, PDF, whatever, for joining lines together. But if you have curves coming together, none of those three are really, and you want something sharp, none of those three really work well. So there is this new arcs line join. It came out of actually, uh, out of it, some work that somebody did in Inkscape. Oh, that one's black, I don't know why that was black. Common ways, hatches. Common ways to shade shapes technical drawings is to use uh, hatching. You can simulate this by using patterns in SVG. You, you have a pattern and you repeat it over and over. But patterns are subject to anomalies at the boundaries and also the problematic for those people using SVG for plotting or engraving because you don't want the pen to be coming, going up and down, up and down all the time or the engraver to, to go up and down all the time because that will leave little defects. Uh, one big one, finally we'll be able to have automatically a marker, in this case the arrowhead, in, inherit the color of the stroke it's attached to. <laughs> Another problem with markers is suppose you've snapped a line from here to here on your drawing and now you want to put an arrowhead on and you want the arrowhead to point right at the end of your line. Well the line sticks out a little bit. So you can, you can bring your line back a little bit but then, you're, but then it's not being snapped to the same place. So marker cutouts are in the specification so you can cut out a region where you, you don't see the path so your, the, sharp, your, the head of your arrow will be sharp without having to worry about snapping, getting things just lined up. Marker placement, you can be able to add, right now you can add markers at the, at the nodes, so you these the pink circle, uh, places where they're pink circles. You'll be able to, in SVG2, put them in the center of a line or at a fixed distance along a path. And of course, my favorite is mesh gradients. Uh, a mesh is made up of a whole series of these patches uh, you define the, cor the colors at the corners of the patches and then the, the uh, color inside gets diffused, diffused in. So here's a, a petal from a flower showing a patch. Ah. There was a pepper here, <laughs> two peppers. <laughs> and, and one was done with uh, as meshes and one was done, it was a photograph and, and you were supposed to be able to tell which is which. And, I've actually patched Inkscape to, as a test bed for meshes and uh, in about an hour I was able to get a very nice looking pepper and, and without, it wasn't buggy and with some improvements I have in mind that you probably five, ten minutes you can, you can make a nice pepper. Now there's some problems that I'm facing to give you kind of an idea of some of the technical face, things you face when, you, when you're working on a standards is, here, here are some, ooh, one minute left. Here are some linear meshes, or uh, linear gradients. And the red shows the profile, the color profile. And what you'll notice, especially in this one, this one here, is it looks brighter where there is a sharp, sharp change in the gradient of the, of the mesh. This is called mock banding. And it's a problem that you see, oh, you you see even more when you start working with patches, you get these little crosses. Well, it turns out that Adobe and Coral Draw, what they do is they smooth the meshes. And they're actually exporting when they export to PDF, because PDF does include these, these meshes in there. Uh, they ex actually export an eight by eight patch array. And if you look very closely at their images, you can actually see this eight by eight array. And that's something we'd like to avoid in, in SVG. And Adobe, we've asked Adobe, and they've said they're going to look at it, whether they can publicly tell us their, their algorithm. And we've guessed what it is. What, you're missing an image there, sorry. Uh, okay, so that's the SVG2. And I'll very go quickly, two slides over CSS, CSS animations, uh, CSS color. I, I guess I've, I, I'll skip this, these things. These are some things that are, apply, CSS things that apply to SVG. What's missing from SVG even after all this, 
flowed text, or maybe we'll get that. Pagination, people would like to have multi-page SVGs. Gradients along strokes, connectors. In the specification already, but the browsers refuse to implement our SVG fonts. Firefox just simply refuses to implement them, and Internet Explorer follows Firefox. And this says, well, if Firefox doesn't do it, we don't have to do it. Also, Internet Explorer refuses to animate, uh, to uh, implement small animation, believing that this new animation is the way to go. There are a few other things uh, I'm going to skip because I want to get to to the procedure of how SVG the process works. SVG Working Group has created a list of requirements based on public input. The inclusion into the SVG2 specification is dependent on someone in the group taking responsibility for that feature. And sometimes you, could, you can help, even if you're not a member of the group, if you help write up or say that you document exactly what you want and, and, and do a little work, uh, it would be very help. Once, once it's in the specification, tests must be written. And there's a multi-step approval process uh, to get it actually, actually released. And now, the last thing I want to stress here is all specifications must have, features must have at least two conforming implementations or they're dropped out of the specification. And since the browser vendors are most active, they're most likely to provide those implementations. And the problem here is we only have a few left. We have Gecko, Presto is going to be replaced, Trident, Microsoft has actually come out and said they're not going to do any more SVG work for a while. They'll see what other people do, so you can't count on them. There's WebKit, so that's only two left, and you need to have then both of them to implement something. And then the, now we have Blink, so maybe that, that helps out a little bit. There's some other implementations, but there are problems. You know, Inkscape does only static stuff. Uh, so what you can do. If there's something you want or need, you need to talk to the SVG CSS HTML working group members. You can join their mailing lists. You can submit comments on the drafts. The drafts are publicly available. The uh, newest working draft was just released yesterday for SVG. And you need to tell the browser vendors what you want. And tell Adobe. <laughs> Adobe is very interested in this because new stuff means they can sell new software to, you know, they're very seriously behind a lot of these things. So, okay, that's conclusion. So it's exciting times for, S for SVG. Thank you. Thank you.